everyone, and welcome to the WPQC series of webinars. that little video presentation that we had up front. Um, my name is Nida and I will be your host for today. Thank you for joining us for the Statement of Work, the Tool of Project Success webinar. The presentation today is garnered towards value addition to specific subject matter expertise. Routinely, before we start, I do ask that you please type your questions in the chat window throughout the presentation. Today, we have a panel of project management experts who will answer your questions at the end of the session. The session will be facilitated by project management evangelist and the CEO of PQC International, Frank Payne. Frank has over 20 years of field threat tested experience from corporations and has served as a U.S. Army combat commander. Additionally, he has billions of dollars worth of hands-on experience on a multitude of projects, including but not limited to information technology, construction, process improvement, manufacturing, human resources projects, and myriad others spread across eight countries globally. Without further ado, I'd like to call upon our speaker for the day, Frank Payne. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. This webinar is going to focus on statement of work. And I want you to know that the statement of work is probably the most powerful document that you can have on any project. The statement of work, because like it says here, it is there to increase profitability and customer satisfaction with the power of a statement of work. Now, what I'm going to do is, as we walk through the statement of work today, here's some things that I'm going to talk about. Why in the world do I need a statement of work? What is it? What's the purpose of it? How do I do it? What's a good one? What's a bad one? See, these are some things that you need to begin to look at as you begin to think about a statement of work. Because when a statement of work is done, it is there to help you and your project team understand what is required. Now, notice what I just said. What is required? The key word here is what when you're dealing with a statement of work. What is it that my customer is asking us to deliver? A statement of work. So let's begin to walk through this. When you think about a statement of work, you think about project failure. Many projects fail today because if you look at the results from the standards group in chaos report, it says that projects fail in a high rate numbers. Look what it says. IT project was completed over budget 189%. That means that you're spending twice as much as it was budget for it. And look at the key factor. It says that and it contains less than 59% of the original functionality. Now, my, my grandchild would tell me, say, Grandpa, that sounds like I'm getting I'm spending twice as much money and get it half of what I asked for. Would you want to do that in life? No. You don't have a statement of work. You're not going to have clear requirements. You're going to have ambiguity, and you're going to waste company money. So this is one of the reasons why you need to have a statement of work. Projects fail because there's too much ambiguity. There's not clarity in what the focus should be. The other piece is, as to why you need it, because it says the first law of science is expressed as the following equation. Satisfaction equals perception minus expectation. Perception minus expectation. See, we all can perceive something in our workplace. 
We are our own perception. Every individual has their own perception. But a client has an expectation of what they want. If you don't meet that need, satisfaction with the client will be zero. That is not a good place to be. I'm writing the book, making sure that you understand what are the clear requirements the client is looking for. And with those requirements, you said, what are the risk events that impact? equals perception minus expectation. Perception minus expectation. See, we all can perceive something in our workplace. We all have our own perception. Every individual has their own perception. But the client has an expectation of what they want. If you don't meet that need, satisfaction with the client will be zero. That is not a good place to be. That's another reason why you need a statement of work to make it happen. When I'm at the PMBOK, the Project Management Body of Knowledge, the PMBOK says that a statement of work is a narrative, description of products or services to be supplied under contract. This is what I'm saying. It's a narrative. It's not a book. You're not writing a book. You're making sure that you understand what are the clear requirements the client is looking for. And with those requirements, you say, what are the risk events that impact that particular requirement? And also, how do I plan to mitigate that risk? Because every requirement in a project will have significant risk events associated with it. How do I deal with that? What do, how do I fix that? So that's going to be another key piece. Another reason why you need a statement of work, that the product and service uh, that you provide from your project is critical to the client. They say, hey, look. I have these kind of problems. You fix my problems. Here's the outcome that I'm looking for. Here's the specific measurable outcome I'm looking for. How do you go from problem to outcome? To go from problem to outcome is to make sure you understand what the stakeholders are saying they need and how they, they uh, want to be clear about what the pain is and the challenges and issues that they are facing. Because the document is all about requirements. It's all about requirements. How to deal with that? The other piece is that work itself is a real critical document, like we were saying. Statement of work. Statement of work. Now, when you think about responding to a, re a request for a proposal, an RFP, you're thinking about how do I write this up so I can negotiate this contract? State work is going to help you do that. The basis of determining price. In that, once you understand what the client needs are, you have to tell the client what investment required to make this happen. So that's going to be critical to you. Another piece is those baselines. You know, how baseline what I need? Because if I don't understand what I need, and I don't understand what the current situation is today, how do I plan this thing? It's kind of wacky because I can't determine what probability looks like because I don't understand what the needs of the clients are. So, again, statement of work, critical document. I can stress that more. It's absolutely a critical document when dealing with projects. So what's the purpose of it? What the purpose of this thing? It's a method of recording and measuring everything I need to know about the project. All the analysis. It's, it's how I write my team together. It's when I begin to look at terms and conditions. Okay? Now let me be clear here. We can talk about writing a statement of work. A statement of work is not a contract. A statement of work is not a contract, okay? Because the T's and C's, which mean terms and conditions, are part of a contract, where the statement of work is an attachment. It's an attachment to the contract. You will find T's and C's written in a qualified, well-written statement of work. It's a snapshot in time. It's there to help you understand what's really going on. So, when does the state work required? When do I need one? When it's selective outsourcing? That's, no, that's one reason. When I, when I get work or professional services required outside of my company, 
I need a statement of work. When I hire an outside consultant firm, I need a statement of work. When I'm selling services or products or anything to a broader organization, I need a statement of work. See, these are things what I'm trying to talk about that if I'm doing a fixed price contract, I need a statement of work. See, you got to begin to understand when and why you need a statement of work. These are critical factors when you start talking about why do I need this and when do I need one. So, okay. all right, Frank, I understand that I need a statement of work. I understand also that you're telling me why I need one and when I need one. But one of the other key factors, well, how do I do this? How do I draft a statement of work? The key thing for you is that, first of all, it has to be simple. Somebody is concerned about how well you write uh, technical documents and legalese and all that stuff. It needs to be simple. And I say simple to the point where there's direct language. Language that eight year old can understand. You need to make sure it's simple. Eliminate all of that that vague eight year old type language. Nobody cares about how technical you are. Make it simple. Terms of art. Write a story. Tell a story in your statement of work. Make it clear. Avoid using any, either, and, or, all these catch terms. Keep it simple. You've got to begin to know how to draft up a crystal clear statement of work. We'll walk through some more of that in a second. In any case, who's responsible for what? Because if I have a requirement, if I have things going on, I need to make sure that I let people know who's responsible for what and make sure they understand how to deal with the details and not, not procedures. Now, listen to me carefully. Everybody has a statement of Work. Remember, the same work is focus on what needs to be done, not how to do it. A statement of work focuses on what needs to be done, not how to do it. So be clear about that. Do not need to pull yourself into you or your team into a situation where you begin to talk about how something is being done. It don't work that way. Okay? So make sure that that's clear. The other thing is how to draft a good statement of work. A performance. Uh, clear. Make sure that everything you're talking about, whether it's terms and conditions, make sure your boundaries and responsibilities are clear. Make sure you have a very good racing diagram that talks about who's responsible, who's informed, all those things that talk about responsibility. Remember how the document can be misleading. Because if you don't make sure that you clear out what the needs are, your client's going to be confused. You need to eliminate all the ambiguity, all the fuzzy stuff in there. Make sure, like I said earlier, that eight year old can understand what it is. Avoid words always, never, uh, minimum, maximum. Nobody know what that means. What do you mean when you say minimum, maximum? What do you mean when you say high, medium, and low? Nobody have a clue. Be specific. Be very, very clear about what you're saying with, with this uh, statement of work. What commitments for improvement? Cost reduction. Avoid all those promises that you make. You don't know yet. You're trying to figure out the what. How do you make a promise? How can you say something like that? How can you promise anybody anything in a state of the world? You're gathering the facts. You're performing due diligence. You understand the risk. Make no promises because if you do, you're going to leave the customer unhappy because, in essence, they're going to catch you in a lie. Be careful with this. Stick to facts. Don't go outside the little bound. Think to the facts and focus on what needs to be done. The other piece is, may I some clear LA service level agreements. All right? Because I need to find the type and location of what I'm going to be doing. I need to be clear about my severity levels. What's a level one? What's a level two? Three or four? Make sure you're clear about what those things are. Because when you, when you begin to get into this and you begin to talk about absolute life, Rolling three months average standards, a one month average minimum. Who knows what they mean? Don't have a clue. Stick to the facts. Be clear about what you're talking about. Define percentages, okay? Never commit to 100%. Land my check. Nobody sitting in this audience is perfect. How can you promise somebody 100% of anything? You cannot promise 100%. The tougher SLA to hire the cost. The customers start talking about make, having you put things in that are very strict, very broad. What they do is increase the cost for themselves, but they also increase the risk of failure on the project. The expectation around force majeure, cover delay, 
Be clear about that. What if the trust will begin to make changes? You be clear about change control in your statement of work. Why well, they change the requirement? You gotta be clear. Here's what's gonna happen. It's gonna impact cost, schedule, everything. Everything gonna go out the window. Because if the client begins to make those kind of changes, you need to be clear about how do you deal with that in your statement of work. Okay. This piece the structure of a project statement of work. This format is really saying that I have a, a preliminary statement of work should identify and be tied to what we call the contract statement of work. So he's talking about two types of statement of work. One's a preliminary statement of work, another's a contract statement of work. When I talk about a preliminary statement of work, sometimes you hear people talk about a preliminary statement of work. Another term for that is a statement of requirement. Now, when you talk about a statement of requirement, which is similar to the, the piece around looking at a preliminary statement of work, here's what we're saying. A statement of requirement is a draft version of a statement of work. So make sure you don't get those two confused because when you're writing a draft, you're gathering information, pulling the facts together before you make it into a final statement of work, which is sometimes referred to as your contract statement of work. So make sure that you do that. Now, it's important depending upon who you're dealing with, you may want your legal counsel to review your statement of work before you engage an outside company. Not put your company at risk based on what you write and how you write a statement of work. Now here's a hint I want to go about. Everybody needs a statement of work that's customized to a particular project. That's the first thing. Second thing, your statement of work developed for a project must have the current approved format. You need to have a template. Have a template for this thing. A just can be however. Be careful with modifying the template when you set it because you need to have a template whenever you're doing a statement of work. Why? Because you need standardization on how you do this. You need to make sure that everybody in your company is following the same standardization and the same compliance when writing a statement of work. Structure of a project statement of work. I tell people that there are 16 headings in a statement of work. You start with the table of contents. We all understand that they give an outline. Statement of confidentiality. Whatever you write on a statement of work, it's going to be confidential. No matter whether you're doing one for internal or for external use, because you're going to be talking about specific things about your company or that client. The next is an introduction. Why are we writing a statement of work? What is it for? That drives me into the service provider. What service are we agreeing to provide to the client? Some responsibility transfer. What happens after you finish this? Where does it go? Roles and responsibilities. What are the roles on, on your side as a service provider? And what's the roles on the client side? Never tell me that the client has no role in this. If you tell me that, that tells me you don't know what you're doing around writing a statement of work. Because both parties have roles to play in the delivery of this service. Management procedures. How do we focus? On How do we focus on escalation? The other thing is hours of operation. What time are we saying we're going to work? Is this a 9 to 5 type deal? Or is this a very unique deal that has to be done after hours or weekends? as well? Those things need to be specified in the state of work. Another piece that needs to be specified in the structure is about facility, tools, uh, equipment required. So, is huge. For what you're doing, both for your staff, your equipment, the confidentiality of the material, security is very important. What are you required? Are they in? All right? You need to be scheduled. I talk about schedule because every statement of work is going to be tied to some project schedule. Next is pricing. Sometimes you hear people use the word pricing. Sometimes you hear them use fees. Sometimes you hear them say, this is the investment that's required. Whatever the terminology is within your company, that's the terminology you should be focusing on when you deal with this. Signature blocks. Signature blocks, I always tell people I like to have Satan work signed in blood. I like to have the service provider signed in blood. I like to have the client to sign in blood. Why? Because I want to make sure that nobody has any amnesia once this thing is written. I want to make sure we're all in agreement in one accord on the same sheet of music. Signature blocks by the key stakeholder or sponsor are very critical to a statement of work. Now you'll hear people say, I'm not going to sign a statement of work because I, I, I'm not 
not wanting to make the commitment. Well, if you've got a person that don't want to sign and they're the project sponsor in the client organization or in the organization, you know off the gate you got a problem. If you're willing to sign it and make a commitment, you have no deal. So that's critical for you to understand. And of course, you got a glossary of terms because the terminology you'll be dealing with, and finally, you may have a lot of attachment that's going to be true. So these are some of the things that you want to focus on. On each one. So let's take a quick look. The confidentiality is a document that ensures that the customer understands the authorization or who's not authorized to duplicate this document. You don't want to say the word being copied, sent to somebody. You want to control where the document goes. You know who's touching it, who's reading it. You want to control it. And that's why you want to make sure you have the statement of confidentiality so if it get out and misinterpret it, you know exactly how to deal with it. It's such a simple. The instructor may say, look, you know, we're here to do a pilot for this particular product. Or we're here to develop a new software or whatever. The instructor really gives people a quick understanding of why you're doing what you're doing before you get to the depth of a roadmap. What are some of the constraints? What are some of the assumptions we make? We all know when we make assumptions, we increase risk. So we need to make sure the client understands. What are some of the constraints? What are the areas I'm going to face? It's good to have those things written out so we all on the same sheet of music. Service provided, this is where you really, really get into the meat of a statement of work. Because here, you're going to be spending a lot of time talking about, you know, this is what the problems are. These are what the issues are. These are what the challenges are. And I'm telling you right now, it is absolutely, absolutely critical that you bring stakeholders together, project stakeholders be brought together to make sure you document what those things are. What are those requirements? It has to come from the project stakeholders. Not from your organization as the provider, but from the client organization. That is absolutely critical. Who has what responsibility? If you're not clear about what those things are, like who's providing what service, what department is the company going to be involved, what are the asset management pieces go along with this, you've got to be clear about who's doing what. The client is hiring you as a service provider to solve a problem that's important to them. you got to be sure that Anything dealing with the network or anything dealing with licensees or anything dealing with, you know, uh, all kinds of migration of service, all these things got to come together. A lot of work. Now, let me suggest to you, when you're talking about service providers, when you start talking about service that you're going to provide to the client, when you start talking about requirements, I strongly suggest that you bring the stakeholders together and perform a JAD, J-A-D. Say joint application development. That's a way to do a very in-depth facilitation of requirement gathering with stakeholders. If you're not doing it already, I suggest that you focus on how to do that. Now, what about service responsibility transfer? To me, it's critical because if you know what those things are, now you know at the end how to transfer the results the outcome to the client and get them to sign off on it, say, yes, I salute, you met me, it's done, we accept this result, we accept the responsibility, so you are now making a service responsibility transfer. That needs to be crystal clear by both parties, both the client and the service provider. Roles and responsibility, I, no, I can't drill this home enough. Role and responsibility of, of this absolute You've got to make sure that on the client side, you identify from the sponsor to the champion to the project man to the programmer to the project team who's doing what. Because you may have to involve other people outside of that team. You may involve marketing or manufacturing or IT. Who is involved with this project? Who is going to be touched by this project? Who's going to be impacted by this project? You need to make sure you're crystal clear about roles and responsibilities. Will there be steering committee? If so, what's the function of the steering committee? How do I know? How do I know who's, who's on it? You've got to be clear about roles and responsibilities. Key factor here, make sure that you set up a very, very good and detailed race diagram as part of your statement of work. That is critical. So when I, when I begin to think about this, management procedures. When I think of management procedures, so 
first thing on my mind immediately will be a dashboard, scorecard. How do I control this? How, what kind of meetings are we going to have? Are we going to meet weekly? Are we going to meet monthly? What about the project team meeting? Is that different? That's going to be different than when I meet with management. See, all of these things got to be outlined and be clear. What about if I have a dispute? What about escalation procedure? See, all of these things have got to be laid out. And, and how do I report these things? It's cool that you have management procedure in place because if not, it will become very disruptive when you sit back and start thinking about how do I solve this problem? We're not getting along. How do you do this in a professional way? Management procedures are critical to drive. I think hours of, of operation, that's critical. <clears throat> I don't want to assume anything around hours of operation because my project team will be confused. I have to do some things after 5 o'clock. I need to let the company know that. When I'm running cables, what if I'm doing some of the manufacturing operations? You have to do no second shift or third shift. We need to be clear about hours of operation so nobody is offended or misunderstand expectations. Facilities, this is critical because maybe I need access to your facility after 5 o'clock. Who do I talk to? How do I set that up? Maybe I have equipment I need to bring into your plant. Maybe I need to bring some engineering equipment, some service equipment. Maybe I need to bring in camera equipment. Maybe I bring in extra laptop. Do you want me to have a policy on that? How do I deal with that? Okay. So these are things that we really got to think about uh, to make sure we're clear about what facility, what tools are expected and what's needed in this particular set setup. I can talk about parking. I, there's a lot of things we can talk about around facilities because what if I have a person on my team that's handicapped? I deal with that. I understand what all the requirements are for facility, tools, and equipment. Security requirements, we talked about security. Some clients operation required that you have security. Some clients operation required that you be escorted. Some clients operation required you can't bring in cameras, video cameras, into the operation. I need to understand that. I got all documented in my statement of work. This is a very important document. The statement of work will break or make your project. If you fail to write a statement of work, you fail out to get with your project. If you fail to do it the right way, you fail with the whole situation. You have no way of communicating effectively on your project. My requirements, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, have marketing requirements. But you know what? Here's what I'm telling you. Depending upon the size of your project, you need to have marketing happen with your project at all times. You need to market how well you guys are doing. I have a team logo. I would have a team mascot name. I have my own little team newsletter. I'm going to keep everybody involved, communicating. I'm going to share information with everybody. I may have a web portal for my project. I'm going to be marketing this project over and over again, and it's my way of communication. I'm going to clearly be communicating to everybody. I'm going to have a kickoff meeting. All marketing. Right? I'm going to have a kickoff meeting. I'm going to invite project team members, stakeholders, sponsors. I'm going to have food. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have, I'm going to blow it out. Why? Because I'm marketing my project. Okay? The bigger the project, the bigger the program, the bigger the kickoff part. And the life cycle of the project, depending on the duration of it, I'm going to continue to market my project. I may invite family members. Understand what we're doing. So, lots of these do you. Schedules. Schedules are impact, uh, very critical. And this is talking about your project schedule. This is an opportunity for you to plan out in advance and have a schedule that all your team members, all the stakeholders are involved with, so that as the schedule changes, you publish a new schedule. Why? It's a communication tool, it's a tool to keep everybody on the same sheet of music. So, schedules are very important for you to have. Pricing. It can be real wacky. Well, that is, you can talk about price to your company. You can talk about price with the client. But pricing is something that you need to be careful with because you're going to be dealing with people, equipment, technology, facilities. you got to consider all of the pricing because if you fail to price this deal outright, you can lose money. You could probably lose your credibility with the client. 
They don't want you back because you went over budget. You did not deliver fully. Remember, she said if one of the projects failed, all most all projects are 189 percent over budget and deliver only about 59 percent of what's expected. That's a good thing. So I need to make sure that I look at everything. What about my travel costs? Do the client when I'm traveling? Or travel costs at costs? Hotel, rental car, airline? You got to make sure all this is clear in your statement of work. Got to be crystal clear. You do a product. I'm the president. You need everybody sign that are key sponsors, both on the surgery side and on the client side. Glossary, I always say glossary terms because we live in a world today where there are terms that we don't understand. I have a client, for example, we did a glossary term, and when, by the time we were done with the project, we had a glossary that has over 4,000 terms, acronyms in the glossary. It was like trying to learn a foreign language. I don't speak a foreign language. You got to be sure you understand when you're in a client organization. You understand their terminology. That they understand your terminology. If not, communication will be hampered. Lots is critical. Attachments are also critical because here's where I may have customer site listing, I may have team members' name, I may have communication schedule, I may have my sample report, I may have my change order template. Attachments are critical to let people know these are tools for communication. And that is absolutely critical for you to begin to look at. Now, one of my favorites about lessons learned. You hear people talk about lessons learned. They say, well, you know, you do lessons learned at the end of the project. Wrong. Wrong. Lessons learned are done from the time you kick off the project, documented and reviewed throughout the life cycle of the project. You do lessons learned throughout the life cycle of the project. Because lessons learned, properly captured, will be used as best practices in the organization going forward. So do not think about sitting around with lessons learned at the end. Why? Because the middle of the project team, most of them are going to be gone. They have done their work and moved on to another project. They're not going back if you write no lessons learned. That is lessons learned that you go through the project. That is a critical month. Use valuable information if you don't do it now. So we could look about this. Then what I call first touch. And I talk about that. I thought, how do I close the calls? How do I make sure that you know, we're doing certain things right? See, let's learn from document things you're doing right. Things are wrong. And that's true. Because who knows? Something you're doing wrong. Because you fix that and do it a different way. So, let's learn whether you're talking about procurement, whether you're talking about contract, no matter what you're talking about. Document lessons learned. I want to make sure that when it comes to service level agreement, oh my goodness, what way to capture lessons learned? Because you may set a service level agreement on your project, and you may find that, oh man, these were just bad. These were not even achievable. So, hey, we won't do that again. Here's, how, here's what, we, what we did to correct that, and, and here's how we fit. What's the lesson learned? All right? So you know how to do it from now on to make sure that you don't get yourself caught up in a legal situation with bad service level agreements. Do You know, do diligence to me is, is a process that says I must take what I have found in requirements then I must verify and validate those requirements. at t has a statement uh, in some of their commercials back. They said, reach out and touch. That's what I'm saying we need to do here. When you, after you get the requirements, after you look at the risk on the requirements, you need to perform due diligence. Due diligence allows you to say, you know what? I need to go back and verify this. I need to validate what these requirements are saying is true because they're not. I could be working on false assumptions and, and, and do the wrong project and solve the wrong problem. So diligence is absolutely critical. When you start talking about client engagement uh, and how you be compensated for projects, when you make a lot of assumptions, you're going to do some due diligence. 
you go out and collect all the pertinent customer information and say, hey, is this right? Does this make sense? Diligence is critical to your success in writing a statement of work and also delivering what we talked about. Because when we talk about that preliminary, preliminary statement of work or that statement of requirement, this is your opportunity to go back and verify and validate before you convert this to a contract statement of work. Because once you con make a contract statement of work, the only way you can change it is through change orders. Because once it's signed, it's locked down. I only change it then through a change control process. So I'll stay in a preliminary state until I'm clear about the facts. I've done very critical due diligence to make sure I understand what I'm talking about. So what's the value of due diligence? I think the first thing it avoids scope creep. Now, if you're listening to me right now, have visit scope creep. Because Murphy will visit your project. You will have scope creep if you don't have a clearly written state work. How to verify and validate? I verify and validate through due diligence. Another one is I minimize the risk on my project because now I'm going back to look at it and make sure it's a win-win situation for both me and for the client. Because as a service provider, I want to make sure I gain necessary information that's accurate to do my plan. I want to make sure I eliminate surprises for the client and for us. I want to minimize and eliminate as much ambiguity as I can. The value of due diligence is critical into your success. So what are the deliverables when I talk about due diligence? The big deliverable for me is making sure that my transition project manager has everything he or she needs to fully transition the results of that project to a, to, to a client and make sure that anything we're doing is matched up. I want to make sure that we look at how to make this work successful for the client. I want to make sure service operations are engaged. How do I do that? I want to make sure that the, the statement of work is so clear, like I said earlier, that an eight grade can follow it. An eight year old can follow it. So, what was win? Let's walk through this. Use the condition assumption and look at how I transact any assumptions made. Now, remember earlier, when I talk about assumptions, if assumptions are not clearly addressed, Assumption will bring on high level risk on my project. High level risk will be brought on my project. So I make sure that I look at how I do this, how do I make this work, how do I drive this so I don't have these kind of problems on my project. It also helps me to understand how to account for anything that may go wrong. Because that's where risk comes in. If we understand the cost of, of change on my project. Change request process. If you don't have change request process in place, look out. Hello, Murphy just showed up. Again, I got to say how do I deal with this. Do this use to validate information. Do diligence analysis of the contract statement of work because it's my foundation I need. Okay? I'm not going to sit in a room and do a jazz session. I'm not going to sit in a room and do a, a requirement session. And I had an SOW in the middle of my conference room or in my office. I need to go to the field. I need to go out and check what is in that document. I need to verify and validate. That's why I do diligence adds value to my project. I need to be crystal clear about what we're doing. Okay? So think about this. You need to think about what your project is. How do I induce this and in, 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 uh, have this discussion with my team, with my client, with my stakeholders? I need to be crystal clear on how I'm doing this and make this work. That's absolutely clear because if your team and you are not on the same sheet of music, if you and your client are not together, you will fail. Stay work is a critical part of being a project. I'm going to keep saying over and over again. So how, how do I control change though? Change is controlled by you having a change control process on your project. Change is controlled by you working with your project team. Change is controlled by you working very and coordinated all the knowledge with your team members, working with the steering committee. These are things you do to make sure you control and change. If you don't control change, change will control you. Change control board, critical. The change control board is also. You need to be on change control board. Your client needs to be on the change control board. Because they need to approve any 
saying it's going to have a cost impact, a schedule impact, a quality impact. Anything that's going to affect the delivery date needs to run, all these things need to run through the change control board. Because you, as a project manager, do not have the authority to make those decisions. Have the change control board. Make sure you use the change control board. Make sure you have the right process in place to use the change control board effectively. So, answer the scope creep. If you've written a very well written statement of work, scope creep is not going to be a problem. If you're managing change control, scope creep would not be a problem. It's when you do not have a statement of work, if you do not have the change control in place, costs, everything, schedule, everything, it's going to blow up. So, what about correlate the price of the statement of work? When you correlate price of the statement of work, it all ties back to the requirement. The requirement that you are delivering, anything you talk about delivering to the client has to be scoped out, has to be priced out. So if you can tell the client, here's what it's going to be for schedule, here's what it's going to be for your investment, here's what it's going to cost you to do this. So make sure that you price out the statement of work to match up with what you're saying, you're going to, what work you're going to deliver. So that's the role of responsibility. The primary role of responsibility. You know, some people say the service delivery provider's responsibility. I disagree. I price and responsibility is, is responsibility of the service provider and the client. Because the client knows what their budget is. Why did you go and present a, uh, an engagement to a client and say, well, you know, this engagement is going to require an investment of $1.2 million. And they went, oh, my goodness, I only have a half a million dollars. See, if you work together on this, you eliminate the surprises, and you walk through the development phase, you walk through the implement phase, you walk through all the phases together and make sure you're clear about what you're going to deliver. Because once you start pricing out, the client may say, oh, my goodness, I don't have that kind of budget. My budget is X. Well, then you've got to go back and, re re and revisit the scope. Don't make the mistake of trying to deliver $1.2 million worth of work for half a million dollars. You will not be successful. You will not get hired back in that client organization, whether it's internally or externally. Value prices and commodity prices. See, we talk value pricing. It's with you saying, here's the value that I bring. Because your client is going to invest a half a million or a million dollars in something. The client said, what is my return on investment? What's my return on investment? And you can't give it no foo-foo numbers. You can be able to quantify the return on investment to make sure that that client is in agreement. What is my internal rate of return? Because maybe that client got to take money out of profit, or maybe that client got to go borrow the money. you got to make sure that you can justify that. Because when we talk about commodity pricing, we're saying that, you just like everybody else. I go from anybody. But what value are you adding? What value do you bring uh, to it? Price attributes. Commodity prices are focused on price comparison. Well, I'm buying this piece of equipment from vendor A or vendor B. I'm comparing prices. Okay? Because it's the same piece of equipment. I'm trying to get the cheapest price. Substitute is easy. I can buy a piece of computer. And a computer. Which would be a better price? A or B. So when I talk about commodity price, low risk, low reward, low market. That's not how you want to be. Commodity price it talks about peace of mind. That price talks about customizing your unique solution. That price talks about long sales delivery cycle. That price talks about high risk, high reward. That price talks about high margin. You can begin to think about this. And you begin to talk about delivering service to your customer internally and externally. Why is this so important? For you listening to me today, you have to sell your idea to your internal stakeholders. They will know what value are you going to bring. Why should I approve this project? Why should I approve this program you're working on? What is that? So listen to me carefully. I'm talking about just you and your external client. I'm talking about you and your internal client also. The same statement of work, the same procedure, the same process. Now, 
Take responsibility. We were talking about this. Management says, you know, what's in it for the company? What's in it for us? We spend this money. And what kind of value do we get? What kind of return on investment do we get? Now, this one for pricing. you got to be clear. What is it that pricing management and pricing they are looking for? They for somebody to be responsible for the budget. To manage the budget effectively to bring value into the organization. So you make sure that you understand what you deliver, why you deliver it, and make sure that scope change equals price change. That's true. What I thought about the price amount of why they need it, because I want a national consistent methodology. I don't want to be baffled all over the place. I don't want somebody gut feeling. I want to know what, what what's going on within what, outside of my company. What's going on within the industry? Just right work. You want management approval process. Margins and improvement. What what kind of improvement are we going to get? See, and then if you don't focus on what value you bring to the client, you know, externally, you you have a problem. Nobody wants to do this. So, so there's a lot of different models out there that you can look at. You can look at models that talk about how do I, you know, price the models or strategy. You can look at price models that does not have any design for the solution. You can probably have price models that are driven by government regulations. It, there's a lot of ways to look at this. What's important is for you to adopt a policy or a model, no particular statement of work, for your particular type of project or program. That is critical for you to be looking at. So what are the key pricing variables? What, what plays a role? Well, first of all, what type of equipment am I going to look for? Okay? Another one is, do I focus on warranties for this stuff? Yeah, that, that affects my price. Well, what is it? Am I buying it in the United States? Or am I buying it in some foreign country? How can it be? Do I have import export? Do you have to pay? All of these things are going to be affecting your pricing variables within the price. Okay. Uh, do I have help desk involved? What kind of call by if I do? Transition activity costs. Do just study. Do I have physical inventory? What about project management fee? All these things are going to have be variables in affecting the pricing in your statement of work. Another piece is, here's the example on the screen, that when I talk about pricing models, I got to think about what's in our file, the RFP, uh, what about this kid, due diligence, uh, client information, energy information, customer knowledge. All these things are going to affect my pricing variables for how I do pricing. Another piece is equipment type one. You remember we talked about skills. What type of skill set do I need? I need people with engineering skills, uh, some software skills, marketing skills. What do I really need on this project? What type of skills do I need? Uh, what about selling cars? What about help desk skills? All these things. i got to look at how do I drive this effectively to make sure I'm not missing some critical components when I'm talking about pricing. Document assumption. What to document? Okay. Call items. If you're working on the help desk, document call by warranty assumption, inventory. Why do I document stuff? So I can establish a baseline. I need to know where I'm coming from in order to drive through my chasm to say, how do I get to where I'm delivering the desired results for the client? So these are two critical things I need to understand when I'm writing a statement of work. All I document assumption. Final outputs. Well, the outputs I'm looking for for prices, what are my metrics? What are my forms indicating? What do my budget look like? All right. What what's the client looking for? The client looking for how how I manage the P and L, the profit and loss. They also look at cash flow. Okay. So all of these things I'm going to be looking for as I drive through this and see where I'm going to be coming out uh, with pricing. I got a cost drivers. Okay. And I'm just going to hit this real quick because cost drivers in my proposal, due diligence. How do those things impact? Me? The other piece is. You know, if looking at my help desk, as a, I'm using the help desk as an example in this, with this statement of work, you got to begin to look at all the variables, uh, SAs, and all the different things you're going to be looking for in, in this. Job costing. Right? Do you know if there's a separate part of your business? How do I fix that? How do I make that work? Uh, no company, ongoing engagements. All of the factors around pricing is critical. I'm beating to death on a statement of work because it's critical that you understand that no matter what statement of work you write, you've got to begin internal and external, drive and look at your ongoing engagement, your ongoing pricing. 
What about improvement opportunities? In the same work, but this project going to lead us to improve some things in our company? What improvement will we have? How do I drive improvement? What I improve it? Do I know what happened with this project? How do I drive other things that's going to add value to my company? Other things that got to be looking for. So, and this is what I'm saying to you. Got to know what's needed in a statement of work. You got to begin to look at, you know, what a statement of work is. You got to begin to understand the types of statement of work. But I want to, I want to close with this. Use the help desk as an example in this particular example of writing a statement of work. You could be installing an IT system. You could be installing a manufacturing line. You could be doing an analytics project. No matter what you're doing. That's my message I got for you today. Write a statement of work. Look at the books that I talked about in this example today. Look at how you need to be doing this. Look at how you should be conducting due diligence to verify and validate the statement of work. Because these are the crucial things that we're talking about here. Now, what I'll do now, I'm going to turn it over to the team to answer the questions that you may have about a statement of work. And these are some experts here in the organization. They will answer all your questions. And so with that, I turn this back over to Mina and the team to answer questions. But I tell you, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for participating. Thank you, Frank, for this informative and engaging session. Once again, I want to apologize for the technical snag, and I also want to thank you for your patience. Um, I'd like to now turn to our panel for the Q&A session. The first question that we have is, is there an optimal length for an SOW? So I would say that there's not necessarily an optimal length of the, for an SOW. It, it really kind of depends. So when Frank kind of uh, alluded to the information that's provided when doing due diligence, if you're able to actually go in here and, and truly understand what's in the environment from a, a current mode of operation, and, and you have a, a very high probability that you've received enough information from the due diligence, then your SOW is probably going to be a lot smaller than it typically would if you weren't able to conduct uh, what I would call a formal due diligence process. The other piece will be determined based on the number of services that are provided within the SOW. If it's one service that you're providing, you're probably going to have a small SOW. If you're providing multiple services, then you're going to have a pretty long SOW. Thank you, Rich. The second question that we have over here is, can you elaborate on the difference between NSOR and NSOW? Just to be back off of what was just said, um, the difference between the SOR and the SOW is when you look into the due diligence that was put in place. You look into the detail of the document. You look into how much information that you're that you're going to be covering in the SOW. Because your SOW, like Frank mentioned, is going to be covering your 16 main sections. So we're looking at our KPIs. We're looking at our service level agreements. We're looking at security requirements of how we how secure we need our our systems to be or uh, the documentation that we're creating. So we want to make sure that um, in your first go around with your preliminary SOW or your SOR, Statement of Requirements, that you touch on that information, but you want to go back and do all the proper planning work in order to provide the, the most detailed, most defined document that you can create. And that document is going to be your SOW. Thank you, Corbin. Um, we have another question right here. So somebody wants to know how much influence should a stakeholder have? in an SW. All right, and if I could just piggyback on what Corbin just left off, on the difference of the SOR and the SO, uh, SOW, one of the key things is, is the SOR does not have the investment summary to it. So the no investments is you're basically capturing what, is, uh, Corbin, what needs to be done and what you will be delivering for the, to the client. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Um, we have another question. One of our uh, members from the audience wants to know if you should follow your own terminology while crafting an SOW, or should you defer to the client style guide or structure? So this is actually very important, and Frank alluded to this when he discussed communications. So when you're working in a client's environment, what you want to do is ensure that you understand the terminology, the vernacular that's used within your client environment environment and not necessarily impose your internal vernacular and jargon within a client 
environment. If you do decide to do that, then you need to ensure that you're using industry-specific terminology, right? Because that's part of the value add that we as a consulting company bring to any environment. We're going to bring industry-specific terminology into the environment and not necessarily speak to what we discuss internally from an acronym or terminology perspective. Right. We do have time for one final question. Um, how do I minimize assumptions when writing in SOW? So I, I can take that, that, that question as well. So you don't necessarily want to minim minimize your assumptions, and a lot of that will truly depend on the due diligence that's done. Right? So we go back to a, an answer that I provided earlier. If you have time and if you're provided the opportunity and the information within the client's environment, then your assumptions are probably going to be minimal. If you don't have enough information, you run the risk of either losing money and being thrown out of a project or overpricing yourself within an environment if, in fact, you don't ensure that you provide the right number of assumptions based on information that you've received from the client and from your due diligence. Well, thank you for that, Richard. We this is, we just have time for um, we don't have time now for any more questions. But I'd like to encourage the audience to engage with us on our LinkedIn page to carry this discussion forward. Before we close for the day, I'd like to remind everybody that we will be sending up a follow-up email tomorrow with your PDO certificate and a link to this recorded webinar. And we will, um, uh, we will encourage you again to log, to follow us on Twitter, to connect with us on LinkedIn and Facebook. Please join us again for our next webinar, which is on May 16th at 12 p.m. EST. We look forward to seeing you. Have a nice day. Thank you.